Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is the ninth of my weekly economic outlook since the coronavirus began. Uh, I don't intend to say too much about COVID-19 this week. Anyone who has listened to me before must know what I think, and anyone who hasn't uh, could read Luke Johnson's column in this weekend's Sunday Times. It's pretty much exactly what I believe. But I will say one thing. Those in the media, those in government, in parliament, in the teachers union, in the RMT, and anyone anywhere else who says that there is something immoral or indecent about weighing the economic costs of easing lockdown against the allegedly beneficial impact of the lockdown on saving lives needs a punch in the nose. I could name names. One reason for not banging on about the virus itself is that for once there have been a few other important economic developments that are not related to COVID-19. Let's start with them, if only to give an illusory impression of normality. First, I guess, was the unexpected resignation of Roberto Azevedo as Director General of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, allegedly for family reasons, but uh, almost certainly because he simply couldn't hack the crap that uh, he was having to take anymore. And I should add, his wife is Brazil's ambassador to the UN, so he doesn't really need the money. As he told Bloomberg last week, we are doing nothing now. No negotiations. Everything is stuck. One major issue is obviously the US administration's refusal to appoint any new judges to the WTO's appellate court, which has blocked the organization's ability to make binding rulings. But, but to be fair, that's uh, as much a symptom of a deeper rottenness than a problem in and of itself. The real problem is that global trading rules are breaking down around the world, not just as a result of Trump. With global trade itself likely to fall up to 5% this year, the consensus is fraying and it's now becoming very much a free-for-all, which is a great pity since the multilateral trading regime had been a huge success. Well, at least until the US changed its tune and let China into the WTO. After that, faith in a rules-based system has been, shall we say, severely tested. It needs a tough bully to re reverse that last decade of decline. The problem is that the various declared and indeed undeclared candidates to succeed Azevedo don't fill me or indeed anyone else with any confidence. One is an Egyptian attorney, another is the Nigerian deputy to Azevedo, a third is Benin's ambassador to the UN. Hands up, anywhere who, anyone who could place Benin on the map who knew who it used to be called in the bad old colonial days. Over the weekend, the FT was touting the candidacies of uh, Kenya's Amina Mohammed, whose chief qualification, as far as I can see, is that she's a woman, and wait for it, the qualifications of Peter Mandelson, whose ability to get up almost anyone's nose is legendary. Now we also have Liam Fox promoting himself. Apparently Cecilia Malmstrom, another ex-EU commissioner, as indeed Mandelson was, has said that she's not interested in the job, which may be a pity because I think she would have been plausible. But, but, in my opinion, there's still one possibility. Step forward, Gordon Brown. This is your moment. The second non-COVID story of the week is, I think, the threat to the EU that appears to have been posed by last week's decision by the German Constitutional Court to require the ECB to submit a pro proportionality assessment of its 2015 decision to boost bond buying as part of uh, Mario Draghi's commitment to do whatever it takes to save the Eurozone. My view last week was that this was a storm in a teacup, that the European Central Bank could rustle up something over a weekend and that the Karlsruhe court would nod gravely, say, that's fine, and we could all go back to doing what we were doing before. And I still hold to that view, particularly since the court has never, never in the past really shown that it has the balls to take on the EU. But others disagree, and they disagree quite sharply. They argue that this is a clear and deliberate attack 
on the primacy of the European Court of Justice, which has already decided that the ECB's bond buying program was indeed legal. For the ECB to agree to provide any kind of justification to Karlsruhe would, it is now argued, mean that the European Court of Justice would no longer be the supreme authority in EU matters. And I guess that means that a bunch of elderly German lawyers would be able to stick their oar in wherever and whenever they want. Shock, horror. Quite sane people genuinely think that the EU could come, up, come apart over this. It won't. There will be a fudge, as there always is, and the European choo-choo train will continue to roll on. The third non-COVID story of the week was also about the EU, and in this case about the UK as well. It does now seem inevitable that Mr. Frost and Monsieur, Monsieur Barnier are not going to be able to reach an amicable agreement on Britain's longer term trading relationship with the EU by the end of June, which we keep being told, albeit without much evidence, is the latest possible date that would permit all 27 parliaments, plus those pesky Belgians who have more than one parliament, uh, to pass the legislation that they would need to pass in order to let us leave the single market with flags flying on December the 31st. Of course, that end June deadline may not be quite as inflexible as the uh, commentariat suggests. Indeed, if push came to shove, I guess that they could all vote in a matter of three or four weeks if they really, really wanted to, or if Mrs. Merkel cracked the whip. But assume it's true, at least for now. The problems that negotiators face are pretty daunting. They include fisheries, with Barnier insisting that uh, we remain signed up to the common fisheries policy for decades ahead. They include competition rules, which are going to be a very hot potato in the post-COVID world. They also include police and judicial cooperation, which includes the role of the European Court of Justice and enforcement procedures for any agreement that's reached, which will also involve the European Court of Justice. But perhaps the biggest stumbling block of all is Barnier himself. As a good Frenchman, he knows which side his baguette is buttered on. And he can always claim that his mandate, which comes from the council, the commission and the, pres the parliament, is very narrow and doesn't allow him to compromise. If Gordon Brown doesn't get the WTO, or if Peter Mandelson doesn't, or even if Liam Fox doesn't get it, we should probably push for Barnier to get it and then hope that an Italian or a Greek will get the Brexit gig. Now, I'd be personally in favour of using the coronavirus as an excuse for an extension, but with one caveat. As it stands, if we do get an extension, we'll be forced to pay up a share of the next seven-year multi-annual financial facility, or MAF, the Commission's budget. And that's going to be a monumental commitment, given the mess that the coronavirus has made to the EU economy. Under these circumstances, it really may be less damaging to quit the EU on December the 31st without a deal and to rely on WTO rules, though, as I've said, they're a pretty slender read these days. There is, however, one other option. We don't actually have to agree a formal extension. We could just agree to stop the clock, a device that has been used by diplomats since clocks were invented. Admittedly, stopping the clock for six months or so may be pretty extreme, but these are pretty extreme times. In the meantime, we have also begun bilateral trade talks with the United States on a free trade agreement. Now, I'm fairly optimistic about this, not least because there's a lot of residual goodwill in the Senate in particular about Britain, and because Trump himself will be minded to make nice to us as a way of poking his tiny finger in Brussels' eye, which is quite good politics in the US. But time is very tight, and the left in this country remains convinced that 
big farmers going to gobble up the NHS, we should be so lucky, and that we'll all be forced to gobble up chlorinated chicken. Just label it as that and see if people are prepared to buy it. After all, we bleach plenty of other foods already. Finally, before we turn to the economic damage being done by the coronavirus and by government policies to address it, a word on oil markets, uh, where the recovery has continued with key marker crudes up for a second week running. Witty, West Texas Intermediate, has now jumped 38% in two weeks, while Brent, the other international market, is up 21%. True, there are a few signs that demand might be picking up slightly. Gasoline demand, for instance, is up marginally in a few United States and the US, but this is primarily a supply-led rally. It appears, and I say this with some skepticism, that total global production this month will be no more than 88 million barrels per day, down from about 100 pre-crisis. Saudi Arabia has apparently done what it said it would and cut to eight and a half million barrels a day, and has even promised another one million barrel a day cut in June. The UAE, the United Arab Emirates, is also apparently offering an extra 100,000 cut on top of what is already cut, and Kuwait has said it'll cut a further 60,000 barrels a day. More important, perhaps, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, is now saying that the US is on track to cut its production, its total production, by around 2.8 million barrels a day this year, with the bulk of those, that, those cuts coming from tight oil producers in the Bakken field and in the Permian Basin, where the rig count is down and where banks are apparently starting to foreclose on smaller producers. Now, I'm not so sanguine about this. I still doubt that other OPEC producers, Libya, Nigeria, Venezuela, Iraq, Iran, Angola, will be keen to keep the taps turned off if they can possibly turn them back on. And I really don't see US demand recovering as quickly as some analysts do. Plus, although the EIA, that's the US Energy Information Agency, reported the first drop in US crude inventories since. Uh, since January last week, the API, the alternative uh, measure of, of stocks, the American Petroleum Institute, is still reporting a hefty stock build. And storage capacity in the US is still very close to full capacity. So just how close, we'll find out soon when the June contract for Witty expires at the end of this week. So Back to the damage that the coronavirus and the associated lockdown are doing to the global economy. As the newish managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, said last week, the global outlook is still worsening, particularly for emerging markets, which are faced with unsustainable debt loads, both sovereign and corporate, and which are inevitably going to default on a humongous scale. As a whole, the emerging markets are now said to owe $71 trillion, with the current focus on the problems of little countries like the Maldives, Zambia, Ecuador, Rwanda, as well as Lebanon and Argentina. And Argentina is expected to default on its non-local law foreign exchange debt at the end of this week. But let's put the emerging markets to one side for the moment. In the US, it was reported last week that initial jobless claims were up another 2.9 million in the latest week, bringing the total to 36 million newly unemployed workers in just seven weeks. It was also reported that the budget deficit for April, which is usually a surplus month, was $737 billion, bringing the total for the first seven months of the fiscal year to $1.48 trillion. Both these figures are obviously records. On top of this, 
Retail spending was down 16.5% month on month in April, and industrial production was off 11.2%. The economy stopped dead. The Wall Street Journal's regular monthly survey of Wall Street economists now predicts that in second, second quarter GDP will be down 32%. And the CEO, the chief executive officer of Boeing, who ought to know, predicted that at least one of the four big American airlines will collapse. On this side of the Atlantic, it was also reported last week that German GDP fell at an annual rate of 8.6% in the first quarter, that Dutch GDP fell at a rate of 6.6%, that Ireland's unemployment rate hit 28.2% last month, with more than 50% of young people now out of work, and that Italy's industrial production was down 28.4% in March. Here, it was also reported that UK GDP fell at an annual rate of 7.5% in the first quarter, which was, astonishingly enough, a little bit better than expected. However, for March alone, the economy shrank a record 5.8% month on month, despite the fact that the full lockdown didn't start until close to the end of the month. In addition, it was reported that according to Barclay Card, which ought to know, consumer spending was down almost 37% year on year in April. That according to the Bank of England, which also ought to know, uh, household spending, it measures this in real time, may have fallen by as much as 40% last month, and that industrial production fell 4.2% 4, 4 in March, or by 8.2% year on year. None of that's really very encouraging. Elsewhere, there were some better signs from Japan and China, but even in China, where industry is almost back to normal, it was reported that fixed asset investment was down 10.5% in the first four months of the year, that retail sales were down 7.5% in April, and that urban unemployment, which is very closely watched by Beijing, rose to 6% in April. That last figure will be a main focus of attention at the National People's Congress, which convenes in person and not on Zoom in Beijing at the end of this week. The last thing Xi Jinping wants is gangs of unemployed youths roaming the streets. So what's more? What more can governments do? Well, the IMF now calculates that uh, the fiscal boost that the global economy has had to date amounts to $8.7 trillion. Though to be fair, some of that is in the form of uh, loan guarantees, which are only contingent uh, liabilities. In the US, the House of Representatives has now passed another $3 trillion package that may well end up on Trump's desk in the next couple of weeks. So some Republican senators are finally starting to balk at the debt that's being taken on. Here, the government has shifted its focus from the smallest firms to the so-called squeezed middle, uh, though it also announced, as you know, an extension of the furlough program Though I think it should be noted that it hasn't yet specified the terms on which this program will be extended. The 80% guarantee is starting to look kind of crazy, at least to me. More important, however, is to get the various national, and at least in the US, the subnational economies, back to work. Finally, some progress is being made, but it's very patchy. And at least here in the UK, the labor unions are starting to get bolshy. Still, in the last couple of weeks, the Baltic states have freed up travel amongst themselves, but not, it should be noted, from other EU members, thereby further undermining the Schengen Agreement. France has imposed a red-green traffic light system um, while reopening schools and relaxing some travel restrictions. It's also starting to reopen Automobile plants, which are very important in France. Austria and Switzerland have both begun to reopen the hospitality sector, Switzerland being first. Norway and Denmark have reopened most of their schools, and so on. However, here in the UK, we have a complete 
buggers muddle with construction workers urged to go back, garden centres opening and some, uh, some public transport being boosted, but no clear plan. One could go on, uh, but it isn't all one way either. France, for instance, reimposed quarantine restrictions on visitors from Spain over the weekend. And we all know the knots that uh, Boris Johnson has got himself into over his own quarantine plans. Same ever, everywhere else. Japan removed its state of emergency in 39 prefectures, but left it in place in Tokyo and in several other big cities. Korea also reimposed some restrictions last week. As for the US, well, Trump has more or less abdicated responsibility, leaving it up to Republican governors to try to open up their states over the opposition of doctors, academics, and much of the media, and to Democratic governors to leave them in lockdown over the opposition of business. The case I like best is that of Elon Musk in California, who flatly challenged the Democratic governor and was threatening to move his uh, plant to Michigan if he couldn't reopen it against the rules. He won California back down. I also like the Nigerian approach. They're going to have a Twitter poll to see if the lockdown should be retained or not. Whatever, the focus is starting to shift to the post-COVID world, or at least, and I think more likely, to a world in which we have to live with the fact that COVID-19 is going to be around for a while perhaps forever. Goldman Sachs put out an interesting review of post-COVID themes last week, which offers, I think, a framework for thinking about the future. Riffing on that, the key messages are, first, that we're going to see a massive increase in both government and private company debt. Inevitably, that's going to mean much higher taxes and possibly at least in the UK, much higher national insurance contributions. Secondly, that quite a lot of those corporate debts are going to turn sour. As a result, governments are going to be left as, as debtors in possession of a lot of corporate assets that they know that they can't have a clue how to manage. Hence the speculation over the weekend, at least here in the UK, about a bad bank or about a NAMA-type resolution agency on the Irish model. Paul Miners spoke very persuasively about that this morning on the Today Show and about the need to insulate politicians from day-to-day -day decisions on which firms to save and which to drown. He's obviously a candidate himself to run a nest of UK FI type holding companies on behalf of the government. Third, we are also going to see a comprehensive rethinking of supply chains. I was sad to see over the weekend that my little aphorism that we would move from a just-in-time economy to a just-in-case economy had been appropriated by another economist, but it's true. Economies and corporates will pay a price in inefficiency in order to restore a degree of resilience, at least for a while. According to Goldman, there'll also be more emphasis on environmental issues post-COVID, if only as an example of what it calls common purpose. Maybe, but I'm not so sure. And also, according to Goldman, tech firms will continue to outperform the market, which I guess seems likely. But I think it's really that massive, hitherto inconceivable debt overhang that will dominate our lives and that of our children. And that will mean the magic monetary economics of modern monetary theory will look increasingly seductive, I fear. Thanks for watching and maybe see you next week.